I informed the Senate that 6, the 6th of February 2022 marked the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, I call on the Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senate. I move that the following address to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II be agreed to. Your Majesty, we, the President and members of the Senate, express to Your Majesty our warm congratulations at this time of celebration of the Platinum Jubilee of your ascension to the throne. We express our respect and regard for the dedication you have displayed in the service of the Commonwealth and your deep and abiding commitment to Australia and her people. Mr President, today we acknowledge the Platinum Jubilee of the reign of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Seventy years, a truly remarkable achievement. Whilst we will, through 2022, continue to celebrate this extraordinary milestone and mark it throughout the Australian community, we acknowledge for the Queen that this milestone also marks the anniversary of the passing of her father, King George VI. Turning back to January 1952, after a Christmas spent in England, a young Princess Elizabeth, just 25 years old, had set out with the Duke of Edinburgh for a tour that would include Australia and New Zealand. The young princess and her family had been buoyed by the apparent resurgence in the King's health. Hence it was with enormous shock when, en route to Australia, in Sagana, Kenya, Princess Elizabeth received the sad news of the King's death on February 6, 1952. The life of the then Princess Elizabeth would be turned upside down as she became Queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and of the Commonwealth. As we look back on those early days of 1952, we find a time when Sir Robert Menzies was only a touch over two years into what was to be his record-breaking post-war prime ministership. Very few of today's current parliamentarians were even born at that time. In a broadcast following the Queen's coronation in 1953, Her Majesty reflected on the events of the day, remarking, I have, in, I have in sincerity pledged myself to your service, as so many of you are pledged to mine. Throughout all my life and with all my heart, I shall strive to be worthy of your trust. Strived she has throughout all her life, and a very unique trust she has earned in Australia and around large parts of the world. Her Majesty has been the reigning sovereign for, Australia, for 15 Australian Prime Ministers and 16 Governors General, pointing to the natural change that has occurred during her reign. Change. There has certainly been a lot of it over the last 70 years. What hasn't changed is the steadfast example the world has come to expect from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Around her there has been much progress, enormous societal change, significant geopolitical change, wars, issues, challenges, many to navigate. Now, today, we see that as much as ever. In these difficult times and throughout difficult times, it has become a custom for people across the Commonwealth and beyond to look to the Queen with confidence that she will project herself, a confidence, an understanding, a steadfastness that provides some degree of reassurance at those times of challenge. In 2020, the Queen's wisdom continued to be a light and comfort in a time of sorrow, as it always has. As the world grappled with the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, her Majesty remarked in a broadcast to the UK on 5 April 2020, and I quote, while we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavour, using the great advances of science and our instinctive compassion to heal. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. At that time, Her Majesty demonstrated confidence optimism, a confidence and optimism that was reassuring and, through that, provided the pathway ahead for the peoples of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland 
and, of course, for people throughout the Commonwealth. The Queen has, across her 70-year-long reign, remained a constant, a stabling presence in the ongoing story of our nation here in Australia and of the Commonwealth. Since her ascension to the throne as a consequence of the way in which she has carried out her duties, Australians have developed a respect and affection for the Queen that is rivalled by few, if any. There is no shortage of qualities in Her Majesty that I'm sure many could point to and that have been a source of this adoration. Regardless of one's politics, regardless of one's views around constitutional structures or arrangements, the Queen's grace and compassion, diligence and dignity come to mind for many, to name just a few such qualities. Her Majesty has indeed earned the trust and admiration of so many of the Australian people. As this year of her Platinum Jubilee progresses, Australians will have the opportunity to participate in the celebrations to mark her service. In step with these celebrations, I encourage all Australians to take the opportunity to reflect on the period of service by Her Majesty and, I am sure, as she would wish, to reflect upon their own lives as to how they too can give more in service in honour of Her Majesty. On this anniversary, I extend the gratitude of the Australian Senate for seven decades of unwavering public service and extend our warm wishes and congratulations and thanks to Her Majesty. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. Today the Senate recognises a remarkable milestone, the plat Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Today is a landmark, the complete meaning of which is difficult to fully encapsulate in this place. It is something that has rarely been achieved by any monarch in world history. And so it is through a combination of circumstances that we celebrate the long reign of Australia's sovereign. Were it not for the abdication of her uncle, King Edward VIII, and then the premature death at the age of just 56 of her father, King George VI, the Queen would never have acceded to the throne at such a young age, on the 6th of February in 1952. Now we observe 70 years since that occasion, the Platinum Jubilee. It was nearly five years earlier, on the occasion of her 21st birthday, that the then Princess Elizabeth spoke to all the people of the Commonwealth from South Africa. And in doing so, she made this solemn pledge. And I quote her now. I declare before you that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family, to which we all belong. And so while now times have changed and we may no longer talk about the great imperial family, there can be no doubt that Her Majesty has fulfilled her commitment over her long life. We know that during the course of her reign much has changed. The empire has now become the Commonwealth, and many nations over which Britain was once the colonial ruler or for which the Queen was head of state have become independent republics. For some of us, we would like to see a change in the head of state here in Australia. But this does not in any way diminish the recognition we give the Queen today uh, for her appreciation of her life of duty, her role in Australia and in the family of the Commonwealth. We join together in that community of nations today that we now know as the Commonwealth as we pay tribute to Her Majesty for the extreme dedication with which she has served. When she made that very famous speech in South Africa, Princess Elizabeth spoke of her aspiration that, com that the Commonwealth would grow to be more free, more prosperous, more happy and more powerful influence for good in the world. It is also worth remembering that the Senate and the House of Representatives do not stand alone in our parliamentary system of government. Our own Senate Odgers advises us that Parliament is a collective entity con con 
consisting of the Senate, the House of Representatives and the Monarch. So in making this address today, we are also recognising the direct connection that we have to the sovereign through our position as elected representatives in Australia's system of government here in the Australian Senate. We particularly acknowledge today the way in which Her Majesty has maintained her engagement with our country, especially through her visits, perhaps most famously in 1954, when she became the first reigning monarch to visit Australia, but also on many other occasions, such as when she opened this parliament house in 1998, and through my own personal anecdotes, her visit to Western Australia in the 1979, 150 years since colonialisation, and indeed Chogham in Western Australia as well. We've seen as a nation her humanity standing with us in our own times of hardship, even as she has endured her own. As the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Albanese, said earlier today, it is possible that we can be a Republican nation and still have the deepest respect for the Queen. She has done her duty. She has done her duty with vitality, integrity, humanity and even with the slightest sense of humour coming through at times as well. So the opposition joins today with the government and other senators to express our congratulations sincerely to the Queen on her Platinum Jubilee, and we extend our very warmest regards on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne. Thank you, Mr President. Senator Faruqi. President, the British monarchy is a racist colonial institution. It is a relic of the British Empire and it shouldn't exist. But sadly, here we are in this chamber discussing a motion to congratulate, yes, yet another monarch on whatever anniversary it is now. We are in a moment in history where millions of people are marching to make black lives matter. Statues of slave owners are being torn down and attempts to decolonize the systems are gathering pace. But these motions serve as a painful reminder to people of color like myself, who migrated here from a place colonized, ravaged, and looted by this very British empire. It is another reminder of too many brutal reminders to First Nations people here in this country who live to this day in colonial Australia, that colon colonialism is not only alive and well, but that its institutions are still celebrated and cherished here. The British Crown sits on massive amounts of wealth that are the direct result of theft of resources from colonized yeah. territories, the slave trade and occupation. The imperial colonizers ruthlessly extracted natural resources from the colonized countries to fill their coffers and feed their power and greed. This extractive capitalist relationship is always predicated on taking more and more. In South Asia, where I come from, it was primarily the taking of resources. In Australia, it was the bloody possession of land and culture. Colonialism is not something of the past, something that no longer is relevant. The deep depravity of what is wrought may never be repaired. In many ways, colonialism has merely transformed into extractive and exploitative global corporations that control vast swathes of the world. You just have to look at the unabated extraction of coal and gas that goes on on sovereign land in this country. There is nothing to celebrate here. The terrible legacies of colonial rule here and everywhere cannot be ignored. Almost all the territories occupied by British colonialists suffer to this day from underdevelopment, corruption, malnutrition, hunger, and conflict introduced by the colonizer. I think of places like Palestine and Kashmir where British colonialists 
created arbitrary borders and where to this day there is immense suffering. Generations of Kashmiris and Palestinians have grown up without the most basic of human rights, to live and to live in peace, and have known nothing but the conflict introduced by the British. There is nothing to celebrate here. Make no mistake, motions congratulating the British royals moved in parliaments like ours are a celebration of centuries of systemic racism and exploitation by the British Empire. And I, for one, will not stand for it. There is nothing to celebrate here. Senator McKenzie. I very, very proudly um, stand here as the leader of the National Party in the Senate to congratulate uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on achieving such an extraordinary milestone. We often talk about uh, women in leadership. This particular woman has led her nation, the United Kingdom, has led the Commonwealth uh, for 70 years years. And she's seen tumultuous times and she's seen extraordinary change over that period, culturally, structurally, economically. Um, and what a, a fabulous example she is on how to do it right. The 6th of February marked 70 years since Her Majesty acceded to the throne at the age of 25, following the death of her father, King George. Of the sixth. Our party, the Nationals, proudly recognises um, constitutional monarchy as a stable and strong foundation for liberal democracies such as us. We're very proud uh, to celebrate the shared values uh, with the UK and the monarchy of faith, of family and of freedom. And it is those three values uh, which the monarchy the constitutional monarchy uh, of, of the British throne and the Commonwealth more broadly have sought to prosecute, particularly under um, Her Majesty's rule. She spent an incredible 73 per cent of her life on the throne and in 2015 surpassed her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, as the longest reigning monarch in history. And no one even questions that she happens also to be a woman. It's an extraordinary achievement. Since ascending to the throne in 1952, Her Majesty has presided over a period of immense social, economic and political transformation, both in Australia and across the Commonwealth. And throughout, the Queen has been a constant presence, a constant source of institutional stability, a rock. In fact, for over half of our history as a federation, the Queen has been our monarch. And this means that most Australians have known no other sovereign. It was my great um, personal privilege to meet Her Majesty when she last visited Australia, um, when uh, the Labor Party, Julia Gillard, actually introduced me to Her Majesty here in Parliament House. And I was able to take my mother, who, ha as a very young girl, had waved Australian flags uh, on the side of the road in Melbourne. Um, at the 1954 visit of Her Majesty. She's seen 15 prime ministers elected here in Australia, and there have been 12 national party leaders during her reign. Over the past seven decades, Her Majesty has cultivated enduring ties with Australians, being the first reigning monarch to visit Australia in 1954. Her Majesty has undertaken 16 official tours of our nation, marking important milestones, anniversaries or celebrations of Australian culture and history, including the opening of Parliament House in 1988. So strong is her tie to this nation that she chose to send the future king to school here for a period uh, of time. And that is actually not, um, not an accidental occurrence. This was a deliberate um, decision by Her Majesty to make sure that the future monarch uh, Prince Charles would actually have a very deep and real understanding of who we are uh, as a country um, and how different we are from from uh, the UK on some in some levels. 
And those ties have um, gone through other family members as well. She's travelled across the vast expanse of our country, meeting countless of Australians of all cultures and walks of life. And like us in the National Party, the Queen has a deep love for and affiliation with rural life and all that it entails. She's a keen horsewoman, backs the racing industry like you wouldn't believe, um, and is, a is known. Uh, and I hear the Greens complaining. Um, but what a fabulous industry, and she's got some great bloodlines uh, going. She spends every summer uh, at her rural estate in Balmoral, the Highlands of Scotland. She's a farmer, and she's also a shooter. And on any measure of rural living, uh, that's the trifecta. That's the trifecta. And uh, I'm very proud that she has so many affinity uh, with rural and regional Australia on, that, on those uh, particular issues. Indeed, Her Majesty has always expressed her admiration for Australians' resilience and their, and I quote, stoic and determined spirit in the face of extreme weather, droughts, floods and bushfires. And it's best exemplified by sending uh, members of the royal family at our time of need to uh, lift the spirits of those particularly rural and regional Australians going uh, through these natural disasters, but also her donation to drought relief for the heart and soul of Australia in 2018 when we were going through those horrific events. And thank you, Your Majesty, um, for, for that, thinking of us at that time of need. I think it's fair to say that across Australia there is a deep respect and admiration for our Queen for her wisdom, her kindness and her sense of duty. I loved uh, in her uh, publicly published um, correspondence, In Your Service, and I think um, her sense of duty and her complete commitment to living a life of service in humility and through tough times is again an example uh, for us all. I'll finish with this quote from Her Majesty. When life seems hard, the courageous do not lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they are all the more determined to struggle for a better future. That, I, that, I believe, uh, provides a clear insight into our Queen, both as a person and as a monarch. On behalf of the Nationals in the Senate, we sincerely thank Her Majesty for leading by example, for her unfailing service, her dedication and her unshakable sense of duty that our Queen has shown for Australia and for the Commonwealth over the past 70 years. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The British monarchy is a racist institution that is founded upon the principle of white supremacy and which exists today in the modern world as a relic of a time when nakedly and without question white people bestrode the earth claiming all before them to be theirs and in the name of that sentiment in that belief wrought death and destruction upon so many peoples of the earth. Now, in the 21st century, it is the cold, hard reality that this mentality lives to this very day. We need only look to the colonial attitudes of the nation states of Europe, of the United States, and indeed of Australia in relation to our own region or to the white people of this nation in relation to First Nations people to see the continuing existence of white supremacy in this world. It is an edifice that must be challenged and torn down. And that great work in which so many are now engaged is hindered by the continual perpetuation of the myth of the banality of the British Empire. The British Empire was a cruel and extractive capitalist exercise 
which took the lives of millions across the world. And the hollowed out, irrelevant edifice of the British monarchy, which now stands in its place, looming over the continuing so-called Commonwealth, is the inheritor to that bloody legacy. And we cannot and should not talk of it in this place without placing it in its context. To do so is to excuse and perpetuate its crimes. Now, I sit here as a proud member of the Australian Greens, a party avowedly committed to the establishment of Australia as a nation under treaty with its First Nations people, that if, as part of that process of treaty, of truth-telling, of justice, decides to take its place alongside the nations of the world, that have cast off the moniker of monarchy and proclaimed itself a republic, then that is what we believe that this country should be. Now, one of the very many reasons that I believe that that is a course that we should take is because I am a Democrat. I believe in democracy and that core democratic tenet that power is only legitimate when it is derived from the willing consent of the people over which that power is exercised. And the reality of the British monarchy is that its power, in the absence of treaty, is illegitimate on this soil and has never been established according to key democratic principle. Sovereignty has never been ceded, and so it is the cruelest of jokes that this place would waste its valuable time uttering a sentence in relation to a foreign sovereign. Now, the last thing I'll say on this issue is as a young person. Now, to young people, the British monarchy exists as a strange combination of two things. Firstly, as a kind of strange, continually present reminder of that poison of imperialism, which is so deeply imbibed into the heart of this country a kind of soft sinew back to the deep-seated racism, the very beginning of the proposition of the continent of Australia, that assertion of terra nullius, that assertion of superiority, the idea that there was a dirt here that needed cleansing. And simultaneously it exists to us as young people the vast majority of us, as a bit of a joke, as an irrelevant edifice kept alive by the sycophantic expressions of journalists that have lost all rudder in their career. So many contributions in relation to the monarchy take the form of individuals that feel they have a personal connection to the monarch and to the institution, when nothing could be further than the truth. The reality of the British monarchy of the 21st century is that it is divided. It is, in many parts of the world, a disgraced institution. And when it comes to certain members of that monarchy at, a, at the current time, it is on trial for crime. And so there is very little willingness in any part of our community to engage with it as anything more or less than a historical irrelevance that should be cast off. Cast off and done away with. 
as part of a process of this country coming to terms with the truth of our history, rather than hiding in the crevices of the past, embracing the wisdom and lived experience of the oldest continual civilization on this earth, the oldest continuing culture, embracing those wisdoms, that knowledge, that holistic, inclusive conception of sovereignty. This is what we must do in this moment. Join the nations of the world like Barbados and so many others that have finally, after all these years, stepped forward into themselves and stop hiding behind an old idea that is grounded in immorality and a set of values that have no place in a modern Australia. Senator Hanson, were you seeking the call? Yes, I am. Thank you Senator very much. Hansen. I do. Thank you. I rise to acknowledge Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne of England. Whatever you might think of monarchies, the Queen is admired throughout the Commonwealth and around the world. She has been a beacon of stability and tradition in a time of unprecedented change. When she was born in 1926, she was fourth in the line of succession, and it was not believed she would ever be queen. Her uncle Edward's decision to abdicate in 1936 thrust her father George onto the throne, something for which neither he nor Elizabeth had been prepared. And less than three years later, Britain was drawn into a world war in which it would have to fight for its very survival. Like many children her age, Elizabeth was evacuated from London when it came under attack in 1940. She was only 14 years old when she made her first public address on the BBC, speaking directly to the many children who had been evacuated and separated from their parents. When she turned 18, she insisted on enlisting in the war effort, joining the Auxiliary Territorial Service. She wasn't given a special rank in this role, although she had already been made an honorary colonel of the Grenadier Guards. The future queen trained as a mechanic in the ATS, and the word is that she still knows her way around an engine. Elizabeth came to the throne 70 years ago in 1952. Her coronation a year later was televised around the world, the first time this ever happened. At the time, our Prime Minister was Sir Robert Menzies. Scott Morrison is now the 15th Prime Minister of Australia to serve during the Queen's reign. That is fully half of all the Prime Ministers we have had. The Queen is the first British monarch to reach a platinum jubilee. Few Australians alive today have ever known a time without Elizabeth as the Queen. What I admire about her the most is the Queen's steadfast support for democracy in Australia as a constitutional monarchy. The Queen understands her role in this model like few others. The Queen understands it is the Australian people who govern our nation and she has never interfered in our government or our elections. The Queen knows her history very well and that the authority of the Crown has been limited ever since the signing of the Magna Carta, which was in 1215. The last British monarch who tried to interfere directly in parliamentary government by marching into the House of Commons to arrest some MPs, that was Charles I, started a civil war and was beheaded for treason. His descendants tried to, to restore the absolute rule of kings and queens, but in the end, they failed. The authority of the British people, exercised through their elected parliament, has prevailed ever since. The authority of the people prevails in Australia too, or at least it did until this pandemic. Our constitutional monarchy works well, when its democratic principles are followed. 
This is why I do not support Australia becoming a republic. We are already in charge, not the Queen. We already have an Australian head of state in our Governor-General. The Governor-General only acts on the advice of the elected Prime Minister of Australia. This system works, and because it works, there is no need to change it. For those who do support a republic, I have this warning. The political class in Australia will never let you vote for a president. They will install their own president and you will have to say, and you will have no say over it. I shudder to think who might um, be installed. Oh, let me think. Kevin Rudd, Malcolm Turnbull, Peter Fitzsimmons, or maybe Paul Keating. Or let's go to um, Christopher Pine. Can you imagine the chaos? There's no need to go down such a divisive road. As a constitutional monarchy, there is no division over an appointed head of state. It's a figurehead role by convention, and that's the way it should stay. And if any future Governor General should get it into their head to go beyond this role, they have only the Queen's example to show them what a stupid idea that would be. I thank the Queen for her service to Australia and the Commonwealth and congratulate her on the unique achievement of a Platinum Jubilee. But also I must um, make my comments known or my thoughts with regards to the bedwetters and the haters. You know, where would they be, these ones that are complaining, whinging about the monarchy and the Queen's service to the Commonwealth? If this country had been invaded, as they say, rather than settled by France or Spain or pick some other country, would you have had the same opportunities to migrate out here and have the life that you have. Here we have senators on the floor of parliament, such as the Greens, whinging and bitching and complaining about the monarchy. The whole fact is that it's because of the monarchy and we are part of the Commonwealth that you were given an opportunity to migrate out to this country. You sit in the parliament now under the Westminster system, under the system that you were elected and have a very good lifestyle and have a say in your country, it's called democracy. So don't put out there the fact is that you believe that the monarchy has destroyed our democracy because it hasn't. We became a federation in 1901, voted on by the people in this nation. So the whole oh, fact no. is to push your agenda of what is actually happening in Australia and you want to hand it back to the First Nations people, I can imagine what this country would oh, look like. No. I don't agree with it. So the whole fact is, it comes down to the people of this nation voted in 1999 against a republic, the politicians' republic, the people who want to take over control and tell the people because they think they know better. But I don't think, think that is right. So I'm here to congratulate the Queen. I have the utmost respect for her, as do many other people. To raise about her family might be happening there. That's not what we're celebrating today or acknowledging. And I'm sure that a lot of families can look in their own backyards to see the problems they have within their own families. You see, they are no different to a lot of other people around the world. Yes, they hold positions. Yes, they are quite well to do. But the fact is that they are still a family. And to sit there and criticise this woman who's given her whole life to her country, above and beyond her family and her husband, I admire the woman. I admire her greatly for what she's done. That is called dedication, loving your country and your people and doing the job that you didn't even think that you would ever have, but took it on because of a set of circumstances. So to the Queen and those people who, who believe in the monarchy, Let's celebrate her 70 years on the throne and congratulate her, and I do from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <clears throat>
We've come to know the Queen in many different ways. We know the Queen as an image. We know the Queen through the passage of time. We know the Queen through her spirit, devotion and dedication. Sixteen presidents of the Australian Senate, fifteen Australian prime ministers, 170 Commonwealth prime ministers, numerous presidents and popes, a record of public service that we could only dream of in this place. Indeed, in this Australian Senate, Senator Dodson was just four years old and eight days when the Queen ascended the throne. Senator Molan was just one year and nine months old when the Queen ascended the throne. And of course, in my home state we, of Western Australia, we've been privileged to have her visit on six of the 16 occasions in which she's travelled to Western Australia. I like to think that six out of six is the number of times I perhaps stood by the road to catch a glimpse. But of course there are a variety of ways to look at this tremendous milestone. We can look at it through the lens of the societal and economic transformation that has taken before her eyes. We can have a look at the durability of the Crown and the system of government that has come to represent. We can also look at the subtle evolution of our own political system that has, over this tremendous period, also changed. And of course, we can look at the Queen through the character of perseverance, devotion and service beyond self. And while today is a very important and auspicious occasion, it's also a very sad one. Of course, the Queen comes to the throne only because of the passing of her wartime father, George VI. And I think it's important that we reflect on the virtues of this Queen, we also reflect on the tremendous virtues and, I would argue, unsung, unrecognised, tremendous work of her father, George VI, during those most bleakest hours, not just in the United Kingdom, not just across continental Europe, but indeed across the whole world. On the death of George VI, Menzies in the other place said that George VI had reigned over us with singular distinction, unfailing courage and the utmost devotion. When we reflect on the strengths of this Queen, I think we owe much to the fact that she was able to witness at first hand the tremendous contribution of her father, her father's ability to overcome physical difficulties her father's ability to overcome distrust in the British establishment and, of course, her father who reigned for just a short period of time. But Menzies also went on to say this. He said that we hope Your Majesty's reign, the reign of the new Queen, may be a long and successful one, marked by the prosperity and progress of the countries of the Commonwealth. The Queen's reign thus far has been synonymous with prosperity, with discovery and scientific achievement. And of course, she's reigned in a world that has become more connected, not disconnected. Menzies could not have imagined how indeed her reign has in fact realised those ambitions of prosperity and progress. A decade ago, a prominent female, again in the other place, remarked on the Queen. She said, but beyond the statistics of this reign lies consideration of its quality and character. Today we honour a woman who has conducted herself with utmost propriety and dignity and who has served her people with wisdom, fidelity and an unfailing sense of duty. Elizabeth II has made history and become part of history. Today we honour her indelible place in the story of our nation and we express thanks for the sense of loyalty and service she has shown as monarch but also as our friend. Over the decade since Julia Gillard made those remarks, much has changed but of course the deep affection of so many Australians has only grown and become more entrenched. 
So on this, at the beginning of this Platinum Jubilee year, I'm confident that Australians, whatever their political creed, whatever their ambitions for Australia's future form of government, and I remain totally committed to the preservation of constitutional monarchy, I think we can all join together in an act of great unity, in an act of great un grace, in recognising what has been a most remarkable achievement thus far. Service beyond self in a way that we cannot identify in any other. I first met the Queen in my hometown of Perth in Western Australia. I was sat on a rug in a school hall in Perth's northern suburbs. I happened to glance up and there on the wall was a picture. I kid you not, I can still see it now. I think it must have been at the time of the Silver Jubilee in 1977, which would fit with my time, my early years at primary school. And for some unexplainable reason, I've chosen to find in her a great deep affection and in my own way try to live my life in public service like she lives hers, practically with humility and constantly with grace and never disturbed by the less gracious comments that might be said about her or around her. So on this great occasion, on behalf of all of those West Australians that share a deep affection for this Queen like I do, I extend to her and all those that support her are across the world our deepest affection, our congratulations and very best wishes for what we hope will be an outstanding Platinum Jubilee year. Senator Cox. Thank you, Mr President. As a proud First Nations woman, uh, I stand here today and I want to start this speech by saying that sovereignty of these lands and waters was never ceded. And it was certainly never ceded to the person that this motion is about today. The devastating impacts of colonialism are still experienced by First Nations people across this continent and every single day. The colonial project started more than 200 years ago. And for me, it's never ended. It still continues in this country to all First Nations people. It has attacked the heart of what First Nations people have lived under for generations, an ancient culture that has five principles, the principle of language and the importance of that. And we've seen the eradication, 350 languages that existed pre-colonisation, now down to about 143. The land that is important to us, our mother, our budja, as we call it in Yungar culture, that has been removed from us, where we were herded into missions and reserves. Our culture, where our old people were beaten for fraternising with their relatives. Our kinship, our family groups, our disconnection, where it's been heard in this place about the Royal Commission on the Stolen Generations that have existed here in Australia and the constant removal of our children. In my state alone of Western Australia, I am 17 times more likely to have my children removed than any other woman in this country. The law that was administered by our old people, that was replaced by the Westminster law that so many have talked about here. It is the greatest travesty that First Nations people on this continent are not treated equally in this country. We experience racism. We died decades earlier. And the trauma is intergenerational, it is profound, and it is all caused by one foundational event. 
and that is the colonisation of this continent by the British Crown. It doesn't need to continue. This is not the end of this story. We know that we can't outchange the past, but we can build a better future, and it starts with bringing healing and bringing people together. But it has to be grounded in humility and in seeking justice. How do we do this? Well, we achieve this together, and we achieve this, and it's been so eloquently pointed out by my Australian Greens colleagues, Senator Fariki and Steele John, that we do this through a national treaty, an internationally recognised framework which Australia lags behind in relation to the way that it treats its First Nations people, but also that it enters into these agreements, these treaties and a national treaty with First Nations people here. And as a recognised international leader, we have a significant role and responsibility to actually undertake this. Our journey to treaty involves truth-telling. This truth-telling will provide us with healing. We have to hear the stories, the lived experience of the generations of people who have been removed from country, who have been removed from their kinship connections, who have been removed from their language and culture. We have to hear that. We have to know that there is a black history attached to Australia's history and stop celebrating this facade. Our journey also involves making sure that we undertake the systemic discrimination and racism that exists in the systems still. That is at the heart of colonialism. The Australian Greens have already announced that we will begin this journey towards treaty by contributing $250 million to establish a national and independent Truth and Justice Commission. This Truth and Justice Commission will be an independent body that investigates and reveals past wrongdoing to resolve ongoing and historical conflict and to help us all heal from that and continue this journey forward together. The Commission will have the powers of a Royal Commission and will investigate and reveal wrongdoing and the human rights abuses perpetrated against First Nations people since colonisation and to this day. This country needs to do better because we know we can do better. We just need the courage and the political will to make that change. Together, we need to explore, understand and reckon with our past and the impact it continues to have on First Nations people and their cultures so we can build that future together. We can walk that path together. The only way we can do that is to start here, in the Senate, the place of the people. And we can do this through a national treaty and treaties with First Nations people. Thank you. There being uh, no further contributions, I'll close this debate, but I wish to join in acknowledging the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Our Federation, indeed this chamber, is 121 years old, and she has shared 70 of those years. We most Australians know no other way than the sacrifice and quiet acceptance of a role she did not choose, but is inhabited without complaint and with unerring grace for all her life. We join in commemorating this moment with the community of 54 nations that we know today as the Commonwealth. Her Majesty has been with us in person for some of the most defining events of our nation. Her Majesty opened the Opera House in Sydney in 1973, in 1980 the High Court of Australia, and in 1998 this building. Her Majesty's visit to open the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in 2011 in my home state of Western Australia was her 16th visit to Australia. We hope to have her example of wise and enduring service for many years to come. I'm sure all senators will join me in expressing our sincerest congratulations to Her Majesty and in extending our warmest regards on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne. 
and I will put the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.